we have commissioners here. We have Skagit, Snohomish, Whatcom, Mason, Clellum, Jefferson, Kitsap, county commissioners, PUD commissioners, important critical key decision makers, real estate professionals, planning department, planning unit folks, so a really good cross-section of our people. And every time we get together and talk about water, it should be really clear that we need that diversity at the table. We need to have those voices and that different thinking of landowners, farmers, fishermen, environmentalists, tribes, because we're not any one of us going to be able to solve these issues with just thinking of one sector. We really need that together. Water law, I think, is one of the most exciting areas of law. It and taxes are the two best paying ones. And one of the reasons is it's so fact intensive. This is not going to solve problems today. It's not about simple answers. It's not about consistency. And you don't want it to be about those things. You want it to be flexible because it's a limited resource and we want to be able to manage it for the maximum net social benefit we can get. We don't want one size fits all from the legislature where the same thing happens in eastern Washington as in western Washington or as in Brennan and Cape George. We want to get together as watershed groups and creatively manage for as much flexibility and long-term protection of the resource as we can. It's about, water law is about history and sex and government and all sorts of wonderful things pulled in together and it's always incredibly exciting to talk about it. One of the visions I have about water law is for 600 years we managed water law under a code called admiralty law and everybody who fishes or has a sailboat knows about admiralty law. And it was so creative in the way that it dealt with limited resources that when these big beautiful wooden schooners would go around the Cape of Mag Magellan and maybe some of the flotsam would go over the one side to save the ship and the, the stuff on the other side would actually get to port and be able to be sold. Water law for over 600 years had an agreement among businessmen, merchant, and government that they indemnified the loss by the people who got to the actual market and they made sure that no one had a win-lose situation, that everybody shared the wealth and shared the risk. And in some ways, that's how we manage water today. In China, you don't have to own any of the rice pads or any of the forestry areas. They automatically get together and talk about how much logging is going to happen in the watershed because they know that sediment from the forest can, can literally sediment their rice beds and destroy their food source. And they just get together as good neighbors every year and figure out how to manage that resource. And that's really the simple... The, the opportunity we have today. We have the opportunity to decide if this is a fight or if this is our, some of our finest hours. We have an opportunity to take a really limited resource. I want to just give you some statistics. When, you know that wonderful picture of spaceship Earth floating in, the, in space? It, it is the only planet that sparkles in space. And one of the reasons is the water. Four-fifths of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Of that, if I had a five-gallon aquarium here, only one tablespoon of that water is not frozen. Only one teaspoon of that five-gallon aquarium is, is in rivers and streams and drinkable, only, or is not salt. Only one teaspoon of it, one eyedrop of it, is actually suitable for drinking. And half of the, that eyedrop in the world is already too polluted to drink. If I were to say I have one clear glass of water that could solve the three main um, diseases that kill children, cholera, tuberculosis, and measles. I, don't, I couldn't get that to four-fifths of the kids in this world. And over 3,000 kids a day die for lack of clean water. That's the global issue, and we don't think we're affected by those global issues. But if you think about it, the biggest air pollution problem we have on the Olympic Peninsula is pollution coming in from China and the Gobi Desert because we live downstream from those factories. We really are in a global system. In Puget Sound, we will have twice the population in the next 20 years. One out of every three acres of land in Puget Sound is permeable surface dedicated to a car, either highways or parking lots. In Jefferson County, 13 of our 17 streams are listed under the Endangered Species Act. Orca may well be listed in the next year. Our houses have doubled in square footage in the last 15 years. 
okay? So those are the kinds of things that we have as indicators of the need for us to come together and manage. It's hard. I remember when I first came to the peninsula, I said, Dad, I'm going to do water law on the peninsula. And he said, yeah, and you could sell ice to Eskimos too. But it's really hard to talk when we think we've got such an abundance of water. But the issue isn't just the abundance. It's the quality of it. It's the place. It's the amount of it. It's the, quali it's, it's the beneficial use we apply to it. It's how do we recycle it as many times as possible in that hydrologic cycle. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to work with the forest industry. And they were fighting about best available science. They uh, were fighting in the tribes. This is a state that, re if you remember the US v. Washington case in the 1970s, we went to the US Supreme Court 13 times on water issues and lost 13 times on tribal and fish issues. And the Supreme Court said that they had never seen such divisiveness in a state other than the busing issues in the South, that we were totally divisive and fighting over the issues of salmon and water and in-stream flows. After we lost that 13 times, I represented some of the richest and most powerful interests in the state, all the timber industries, banks, title companies, irrigation companies. They had much more power and money than we have in this room. And after about two years of a million dollars a month in litigation, they realized that they could continue to fight, continue to destroy streams, continue to lose money, continue to lose options, and cleanup was going to be a lot more expensive than prevention. And if you at, wonder about that, just notice that LA just agreed to spend $400 billion to restore the wetlands and streams that they uh, destroyed in the 1940s with their irrigation projects. So we want to act on the side of prevention and not clean up. 20 years ago when I came to the peninsula, some of you are from SQUIM, we made a pact that we would act before the crisis. We were the site of the first watershed plan in the state. We were the site of the first salmon stream in the state. They created a trust water right for salmon, perhaps in this region. We can propose a trust water right for agriculture and local food production and the things that keep us rural. We have a choice of whether we see each other as enemies or joint problem solvers, whether we stereotype and deal with fear, or if we say that this is one of the great challenges of our generation. My generation wasn't asked to necessarily go to war. My generation wasn't necessarily asked to cross the West in, in wagons and face the unknown. What we are asked to do is come together and do the, the fine task of how do we protect our quality of life, natural resources and water, while we have growth and economic prosperity. That doesn't happen with us yelling at each other or being fearful. It happens when leadership steps forth, people like you in this room, with business acumen and government expertise and a sense of place, and say that this could be our finest hour. The peninsula is known worldwide. So to look at this as a potential for all of our youth and all of our young people, and we work with 4-H all the time, they're learning GIS, they're going out and doing salmon restoration projects. They're becoming biologists. Some of the kids are, that were involved in the early salmon restoration projects are just now becoming back with their bachelor's degrees and their master's degree, looking for ways to live in these communities and do stewardship of their natural resources. So I'm hoping that today is a kickoff for a tremendous amount of hopefulness of how we as a community can work together to solve these complex problems. They're not simple, and what that means is there's room for everybody at the table. Today, you will hear seven of the most critical decision makers in the state, private and public, government and, and industry, Washington Association of Realtors, large environmental group. And some of you may think, God, I'm hearing the same thing about seven times. Listen harder. The magic is to hear what each one of them is articulating in maybe some subtle ways about what's a common ground that you have with them. Where's their mutual gain? And where is there some possibility for realignment and creative new innovations? It's not about splitting the baby. It's about creating a third alternative. And it's a deep challenge to people who, if you're simple and want simple answers, this isn't the issue. You've got to think complex. If you think you can make decisions by yourself, Water law is not where you need to be, because like good business companies, we need to work on a team. If you think you have one answer that fits all uncertainty, this isn't your issue, because it's going to keep changing and keep demanding as science and our landscape changes. 
But if you're deeply rooted in this community, and you think that just as the realtors made money when the interest rates were 18% because you created rollovers and balloons and all sorts of creative places, then this is the table for you to be at in a community leadership way. And this is the room where you're going to start hearing some of the best information and be challenged to be part of the answer. So thank you for being here today. Appreciate it. We'll keep moderating through, ask questions on your sheets.